Good afternoon. Welcome to the Korea Society. I'm Stephen Norper, Senior Director for Policy here at the Society. Just wanted to note that we have our calendar out. We have 11 policy events over the next 16 weeks, so we look forward to welcoming you all back members of the Korea Society and the Japan Society uh, whenever we can see you. And for membership material, uh, we encourage you to join both organizations for all our great programs. Thanks so much. And now President Tom Byrne of the Korea Society. Well, thank you uh, for coming today uh, for today's discussion on the current challenges in Korean-Japan relations. Constructive and harmonious relations between Japan and South Korea are necessary for Northeast Asia peace and prosperity. The two remain America's most important and strongest allies in the region. And in the face of North Korea's challenges and a rising China, we need strong Korea-Japan relations. To explore the current situation and consider what role the U.S. should play, we have with us today Ambassador Thomas Hubbard, Chairman of the Korea Society, and Dr. Sheila Smith, Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. As many of you know, Tom served as United States Ambassador to the Philippines and to the Republic of Korea, uh, but he also has uh, dedicated over half his professional diplomatic career to U.S.-Japan relations. Dr. Sheila Smith is the foremost expert on Japan, and her new work, Japan Rearmed, is impressive and was the subject of an excellent Japan Society program. Tom and Sheila, welcome back, and it is a pleasure to have you again on the stage uh, for the third time, I, I believe, uh, to, to discuss uh, Japan-Korea-U.S. relations. Sheila and Tom will have a dialogue for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So, Tom? Well, thank you, Tom, and uh, it's, it's good to be here. It's good to see uh, representatives of both uh, the Japan side of the dispute and, and the Korea side of the dispute in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the room together. And I think as Tom said, Sheila and I have spoken on this topic here at least once or twice in the, in the past. It is a, uh, it is a long-standing um, topic and one that has been debated through the years. But I, I think we all can agree that perhaps we're at a time where trilateral cooperation between the U.S., Japan, and the ROK is as important as it has ever been, uh, with the North Korea challenge still very, uh, very palpable, uh, with the rise of China creating uh, various changes in the uh, in the uh, strategic uh, situation in Northeast Asia, uh, and at a time when uh, you know we have two U.S. allies, two democracies, and two of the world's leading economies right there in the same region, and and calling for uh, uh, cooperation. Yet this problem, the uh, dispute between. Uh, Japan and Korea, I, I don't think has ever been uh, more difficult or, or more challenging. Uh, through the years, uh, we've all dealt with various territorial disputes and issues. Uh, we've, we've dealt with the uh, uh, very uh, serious humanitarian problems relating to the uh, so-called comfort women, et cetera. But now, for the first time, I think we have this diplomatic and humanitarian set of issues spilling over very dramatically into the trade field, uh, with Japan having uh, curtailed some very the uh, export or attached conditions to the export to uh, to Korea of some some very important materials. We now have it affecting uh, supply chains, not only between the two trade chains, but not only between the two countries, but uh, globally at a time of great uncertainties in, in trade where, wherever we are. And, uh, and we also have it now spilling over uh, into the security area with uh, uh, one of the positive developments over the last several years has been finally Korea and Japan signing an agreement called the GSOMIA that uh, allowed direct exchanges of, of, of intelligence between Korea and Japan, whereas up until now, much of that intelligence exchange had gone through U.S. channels. Now, uh, 
Now the, now the Koreans have, uh, in response, I think, to some of the measures the Japanese took, um, have, uh, have announced their intention to, to withdraw from that uh, agreement uh, later this month. Uh, and on and on. Uh, communication seems to be uh, worse than it has ever been between the two countries. So I, I wanted to start out, Sheila, by asking you, why is it so much worse this time? Well, thank you, Tom. I am delighted to be here. And I want to thank the members of the Korea Society and the Japan Society for joining us in this conversation. We have a lot of experts in the audience. And so I look forward to hearing from you in the Q&A session. This may be a series of conversations that we need to have, but um, but thank you for coming. I, I'm here because I'm worried. I'm worried about the Japan-Korea relationship. It's not only very important to the United States, but it is just very important in Northeast Asia. And I think, Tom, as you pointed out, we are at a very rapidly changing geostrategic place in Asia. Uh, we don't have to demonize any one country in the region, but we understand that there are challenges serious challenges ahead. Uh, and this is a time, I think, for the United States, Japan, and South Korea to try to find if we have common cause in meeting those challenges or if we're really starting to see them in very different ways. It's a very big question. We don't want to answer it here, but I, mm -hmm. I'm beginning to worry that, in fact, uh, South Korea, Japan, and maybe even us, we are starting to see our strategic interests quite differently. And if that's the case, then we are in for a very difficult relationship beyond just the tensions that Tom outlined. I think one thing, and I think this, this, this comes from Tom's remarks as well, the ballast in the Japan-South Korea relationship, in other words, the interests that were in the relationship, and by this I mean the business leaders, business communities in both sides, uh, the militaries and strategic planning communities in both sides, that ballast was always if not always steady, it was always there to steady the relationship at times, as Tom said, when there were some political issues or tensions. Um, and I think what we're seeing today is that ballast is eroded considerably. So inside the political communities in Japan and in South Korea, it is harder for people who have a, a, a conviction that the relationship is important. It's a harder for them to make their voices heard in the politics in both countries, frankly. I think the other is, you know, quite obviously, the United States may not be able to help in the same ways as it has in the past. We have a, a, a new president uh, who is rethinking or at least articulating some qualms about our alliances, uh, about whether they're in American interests or not. Now, the American people are overwhelmingly in support of both the U.S.-Japan alliance and the U.S.-ROK alliance. So I, I don't mean to startle everybody. But, but we all know that there's an ongoing conversation about burden sharing in the alliance and about whether or not our allies are doing enough uh, for their own defenses. And that's equally visible in Europe, but it's also clearly visible in Asia as well. I worry, therefore, that our role may not be the same and that both Tokyo and Seoul may be having ex expectations of us that, in fact, may not be realized. So I think there's a lot of dangers in this current episode that were not obvious and were not really at play in earlier episodes, and I'm, I'm worried. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, let me just share a, a couple of anecdotes uh, from the uh, Korean side that might, might help broaden this discussion. Uh, I uh, last was in, in uh, Korea earlier this year, just as this crisis was beginning to become apparent. And I, I met with several of the big business leaders, the table leaders, and each and every one of them appealed to me, I think in my capacity as chairman of the Korea Society, and perhaps thinking I might have some influence on U.S. government, appealed to me to, can't you solve this problem for us? Can't, isn't there some way you can help us solve the, the problem? And, you know, my, my answer is, uh, you know, let's try. <laughs> you know, we'll see if, you know, obviously, Korea and Japan, you have to solve it yourselves. But, uh, you know, in the past, the United States has played something of a mediator, a, a convener role, and... And uh, and you know perhaps there's something we can we can do this time. Uh, 
one of the things that they were very, the Korean side, Korean business side, was very concerned about was the, uh, uh, the Japanese this year for the first time declined to come to Korea for the annual uh, dialogue between business leaders, between K Don Ren and FKI or whatever the grouping was. Uh, and, and they thought partly because of, uh, um, because of uh, Abe didn't want them to, but partly because they were concerned about, we haven't mentioned these court decisions, uh, they particularly concerned about the court decisions, which are one of the, the, the new elements. And so, uh, you know, I, I came back thinking, you know, can't we do something? And things kept getting worse and kept getting worse. But one of the, uh, one of the people that I have long relied on for uh, advice on, uh, on, on Japan-Korea relations is now, like me, uh, retired from government, but played a Korean diplomat who played a big role uh, with Japan in and, and, and a variety of ways and has continued to, to do it um, uh, in, uh, in retirement. And, you know, he said, you know, he, he was worried, deeply worried, as the business people were. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, this time, you know, in the past, almost all of these crises we've had have been as a result of, of something the Japanese did. Prime Minister visits Yasukuni Shrine or, or textbook comes out or, you know, somebody asserts the claim to, uh, to uh, Tokto Takeshima. Uh, he said, but this time, you know, we started it. <laughs> the Korean side started it by, uh, with this, this court decision. And, uh, and, and it's uh, in the midst of a, you know, kind of a trying political time for us, you know, it's much more difficult for us to solve the problem that way. Mm. I, I wonder if you had any. So I, I think I think that's right. I think there's deeper causes at, yeah. at play here that are not necessarily going to respond to diplomacy. <laughs> and by that, I certainly mean the changes in South Korean politics itself and the institutional balance, for example, between the courts and the executive branch. There's a, there's a pretty obvious and strong tension. There are others here in the room more expert than I on Korean politics. But, but the institutional dynamics of Korean democracy are shifting. And this is, in some ways, get, Japan is getting caught up in part of that. Um, the courts now are asserting themselves in ways over uh, executive decision-making and diplomacy uh, that are new to the relationship, was not part of the, 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 the picture a decade ago. Um, I worry a little bit about, again, the political capital that is easily <laughs> available in both countries uh, for a more rigid position on the other country. And again, I don't say that as one country is to blame, but it's a reality today. It is hard for, harder for friends of South Korea in Japan, or and I assume friends of Japan in South Korea, to make the case for the relationship because of the sensitivities in both countries today. Um, that takes very strong leadership to overcome. So that, again, I think puts the burden uh, on the Kante on, uh, and on the Blue House, in fact, it, to lead that process. I think we should give credit where credit is due in the last six to nine months. There have been efforts by leaders on both sides to clarify the export restrictions, for example, mm -hmm. to clarify the court cases, for example, um, on the 73rd anniversary of, of Korea's liberation, I think President uh, Moon gave a very uh, powerful statement of his desire uh, for a better relationship with Japan. Um, so there's no lack of intention, I think, in some ways to dampen down the, this dynamic, but it's gonna take an awfully strong follow through, I think, politically to make it happen. One thing I, I, I do think on the causality, too, is, again, to go back to the international context or the regional context within which this is happening. Um, one of our guests today just said hello to me and said, it's so counterintuitive at this moment in Asia to have Seoul and Tokyo be at odds this way, right? But I think that demonstrates the intensity of this issue politically at home. And again, it may demonstrate a slightly different calculus in both capitals about China's role in the region, about the efficacy of our alliances. I don't know, but I do think there is a, an external calculus at work too that we don't often think about. We often go back to uh, history. Uh, it's a longstanding dispute. Yeah. But today, the strategic implications of these these choices are being are being made. I mean, these choices are being made despite 
the strategic implications. And I think that's a very different piece of the puzzle. Can I add one last piece on this, Tom? And I think it's what we need to be very, very alert to is that there are a number of people of countries in the region that could take advantage of this easily. And so that's not a cause, that's a consequence. And I think we saw it very quickly, very quickly, when Russia and China uh, conducted their joint air patrol. Uh, and the Russians, not the Chinese, but the Russian surveillance aircraft, not once, but twice, went into the airspace over the disputed island. I won't name it <laughs> in our, sen in our you know, sensitivities at the moment. Um, Leon Court rocks. <laughs> Leon Court rocks, okay. Um, but, but that was deliberate. There's no other way to understand that than to say, um, let's test that animosity. Let's test and see just how much trouble we might be able to stir up. Now, I think that's a, 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 a clear alarm bell for all of us. And I know in Washington, it's, it was a, a, a quickly conveyed to both Tokyo and Seoul that this is a, this is a, a moment of exploitation we shouldn't ignore. Yeah, I agree with that uh, last comment. And, um, and uh, I think we're, we're also seeing in our discussions with North Korea, et cetera, the, 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 uh, the result of, of, of this perceived uh, Tension. Obviously, uh, the North Koreans now feel they have more kind of uh, sway over South Korea than they did a few months ago. Yeah. Before, partly because I think of these disputes. Mm -hmm. I wanted to back up a little bit and and, and philosophically, I, I'm I'm glad Tom mentioned it because I, I, uh, you know, I, I was ambassador to Korea. I'm chairman of. Korea Society, but I, I, I started out as a Japanese language uh, officer and, and spent uh, many years managing Japanese affairs as well as later Korean affairs in the State Department. And I've always felt that the Japanese, because of their very different democratic experience, kind of fail to recognize the power of of democracy in in Korea today. Uh, this is not your 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 grandfather's uh, South Korea, where you could go in and meet with the president and fix it, or meet with Kim Jong Il and 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 fix it. Uh, it is a very vibrant uh, democracy, and whereas in in Japan, <laughs> to be a little cynical, it's the, there's basically been one party rule ever since the the end of uh, of, of World War II with a few quickly abandoned exceptions, uh, you know, there's been one party rule, there's a very strong bureaucratic, bureaucracy and bureaucratic mm -hmm. tradition, and it's not a presidential system with separation of powers. In the case of Korea, uh, there has been uh, a number of, of, of changes in, in government, and uh, as we've seen so dramatically in the United States, uh, as the world has seen from the United States, elections have have consequences, and you can't expect the same kind of, you know, continuity uh, that has happened partly because of the bureaucratic system. I think in, in Japan, and there is a separation of powers. Uh, you know, in, in the past, uh, uh, you know, presidents have tried to uh, tried to manipulate the courts. In fact, that was part of I think the downfall of uh, of uh, of, uh, of the previous. Uh, uh, of, of Park Geun Hye, and the, the previous government in Korea, and there is a backdrop, and they've had this shift. So, I, you know, I don't think you can expect the same kind of of, uh, of of continuity. And I think, to be in my mind, the Japanese fail to to quite recognize that, but partly because of their different experience, and partly because of the colonials' uh, experience. Can I respectfully disagree? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, I, I think you're right. Single party dominance in Japan was the name of the game, but as of the early 1990s, in fact, that's pretty much been shattered. Now, the LDP has come back yeah. to power. I don't think there's anybody in Japan that doubts that, that, that Abe Shinzo leads a party that has been rejuvenated in opposition yeah, yeah, yeah. when they were away, when the yeah. DPJ took over. A very um, short time. <laughs> yeah. It was three years, and yeah. that for the Japanese political history, yeah. that was a significant um, change. But all I'm saying, Tom, is that uh, Japan is a parliamentary system. 
as you pointed out, Korea is a presidential system, mm -hmm. so their dynamics are different. But I wouldn't take that to the step that Japan's democracy is weaker than South Korea's. No, I didn't mean to say yeah, that. Yeah, I just want to no, I, I know you didn't, and that's why. I didn't mean to. It's a different it's, system. It's a different system, yeah. and, and they've had different experiences in it. But yeah. I think one of the arguments that it, it does come out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it does come out, I think, not just from conservatives, mm -hmm. but from others in Japan as well, is that if we have to renegotiate difficult agreements every five years, in other words, every time there's a new president, yeah. then that's also very difficult. So again, we want to be very careful here not to say one side or the other is yeah, at yeah, fault, no. but there are... I didn't mean, I just, I, I, I'm trying to address the question of understanding. And, and but, uh, Yeah, but yeah, I think you're right. There's structural differences in the yeah, way the government right. works in both yeah. sides, and that also affects the way in which um, the dynamics play out. But I think this round is not the same. I don't think this is a question of elections mm -hmm. that the, there are there is very little going to the polls in tokyo based mm -hmm. on the japan south korea relationship mm -hmm. for example there may be more electoral kind of ability to mobilize support in the korean context about japan than there is the other way around mm -hmm. i think if i had to put my kind of anecdotal kind of finger on the pulse mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, antenna out here a little bit in japan it's a little bit slower it's a slower kind of feeling that it's hard to work these issues through. Yeah. And we do have in both countries generational change. You know, yeah. we are considerably far away now from the actual events that, that much of these political discussions are focusing on. So there is a frustration on both sides in a younger, in a younger cohort that also needs to be addressed. Um, I, I am not one that thinks that all of the issues of historical memory can be negotiated. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, this is, we're talking about human, you were talking about emotion, Historical memory has, is long standing. You can look to our country and our, our Japanese American experience here. It took several generations for that community to stand up and say, we were badly treated in the years during the war in the United States. It was unconstitutional. We need this to be addressed and acknowledged. And it took our Congress many years afterwards to be able to do that. And that's for Americans speaking to Americans. So I, I do sense that there is generations of conversation. It's changed over time. And if I, if I would say one piece where I understand it's hard for Japanese, uh, especially the Japanese government, is to figure out, well, what do we do about that, right? How do we address it, not necessarily through diplomacy or a new agreement or throwing out the peace treaty, or any of that kind of things that we think about in the diplomatic world. But how do you address it more substantially so that there's a place where you can have those conversations, yeah. right, and inc encourage younger Koreans and Japanese to have those conversations? Now, many of us here in the United States have Korean and Japanese students in our classrooms, mm -hmm. and so we have a space where we can do that. I think it's much, much harder. And I think if I had any, um, if I could wave a magic wand, I would say that some of the constituencies in both countries, not necessarily the governments, but not exclusive of them, could take a much, much more strenuous leadership role in trying to create venues. And that's the corporate world. It could be the media. It could be universities, obviously, to create venues where the South Korea-Japanese conversation can happen without recrimination and without the kind of rigidity that we're starting to feel today, that's very hard to accomplish. But that's probably where places like the Korea Society and the Japan Society can perhaps help. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons uh, that, that, that I was so dismayed to see this rupture in the business mm -hmm. community and, and the, uh, the whole dispute having kind of spilled over and in, into the, the trade area because the business to business ties uh, have, have been a very key part of the relationship in a place where this kind of dialogue you talked about has taken place. I, I, uh, I've, I've spoken several times in Japan, right. you know, on, on the same issue with Japanese always asking me, you know, how, how can we figure out a way to uh, deal with Korea better? So I, I think the business tie has been very important, and I, I, I hope we can patch that side up mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. And and the defense side, uh, this Korea's decision on Jisomia was, a, I think, a very unfortunate one. Um, the uh, uh, It's symbolic of, of closer Japan-Korea cooperation within the context of our 
trilateral relationship and our separate alliances, but also has had some very practical value, yeah. uh, particularly in, in trying to uh, analyze what's happening with all these shorter range missiles that the right. North Koreans are are are, are testing. Uh, it was it was a it was working well and mm -hmm. to our common uh, benefit. So again, we need to find some way to get the uh, the military side uh, yeah. back into. Uh, it might be helpful to, I don't know if this audience pays a, a lot of attention to missile launches and, and, and communications and intelligence communications, but for example, in 2017, the Jusomnia was absolutely crucial. And for the first time with, with all of those short range and then the ICBM tests that came with it, um, th it was the first time that you really had synchronization of U.S. forces Korea or U.S. ROK forces with U.S. Japan forces in Japan. And by that, I mean, of course, there are deep sensitivities in South Korea, obviously, about having Japanese military forces on sovereign soil. But mm -hmm. there was an awful lot of demonstration by the United States, Japan, and South Korea that mm -hmm. should there be a conflict, you know, don't miscalculate. Both of these alliances will be coordinated, and they will respond. So that kind of signaling, the two alliances were quite synchronized mm -hmm. in 2017. It was very effective. And, and respectful of the sensitivities of, of, of South Korea, particularly. If I, uh, yeah, did, so as I was, you were <laughs> implying that I was criticizing the Japanese, which I, I wasn't trying to do, but I think there's a another a gap in understanding. I think, you know, virtually every Japanese policymaker and, and, and the public basically realizes that, that you know, so the uh, that Korea is very important to their national security. Mm -hmm. uh, that the U.S. alliance with Japan in these days is, to a large degree, focused on 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 on, on Korea, and uh, you know that's part of the national security. Koreans, the Korean public, does not, to an equal degree, recognize how important our military presence in Japan is yeah. to our ability to to defend. Korea, and it's always a very sensitive topic. Uh, but the Korean government, I don't think, has done enough mm. to try to persuade its public of the of the importance of this uh, this this yeah. trilateral relationship to yeah. them. Now, a lot of our bases in Japan are UN designated bases, which yeah. were UN designated for a Korean yeah. contingency. I think it's also we don't often think about this because, thank goodness, we don't really need to. But non-combatant evacuations from the Korean Peninsula, should there be a conflict, would all be going through Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a there's a very deep enmeshing on both sides of 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 that. You know, not only the forward deployment of U.S. forces, but also mm -hmm. thinking about how a Korean contingency might affect both all three countries, right? The re um, reason why we have all these problems over uh, over our facilities in Okinawa right. is they're there for Korea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in, in fact, so yeah. that's a it might also be useful. There are others in the room who are more expert on this than I am, but it might also just be um, important to be clear about the economic impact in addition to the security impact. You know, if you start to see a de disentanglement of Japanese and South Korean industries, I think the export restrictions, the items under the export restriction system could be a total of $6 billion worth of goods. Uh, I think it, again, bears clarification that the question that the Japanese METI was asking, it took a while for them to be clear about what question they were asking, to be sure. But the question they were asking is they understood how the South Korean export controls worked on WMD and uh, missile, right? Uh, especially the items related to missile uh, capability. But they didn't understand how they were applied to conventional military goods. And that's the clarity that the, the Japanese were looking to get uh, in the consultations. But, but there is an economic impact of not only the goods themselves, should they not be purchased anymore through by Koreans of Japanese goods, but also the implications of the boycott, which as you know, is pretty, pretty strong now. Uh, there's a lot of popular support for the boycott of Japanese goods in South Korea. So there will be ripple effects on the trading relationship between the two of them. And the disentanglement, if that becomes a real policy, diversification of sources, right, um, that will also add to the long-term economic impact for both countries. I think the message, though, Tom, I wanted to come back to the point you made early on, is the messaging to glo the global trading regime, if we want to call it that, is pretty strong, yeah. and it's coming at a time when obviously we are challenging, right? A multilateral 
trading, the liberal order, as we, we use the shorthand for, there's just an awful lot of pressure today on our international trade, and, our, and then that will inevitably follow on our international finance. This is just one more pebble in that, in that pond, uh, but it's a very important one, very critical uh, signaling, right, of the willingness to disentangle if that becomes a strategic necessity. And I think it's worth just pausing there on the economic side uh, because it, it too has strategic consequences, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for your illuminating, insightful, I think fascinating discussion thank you. on this issue. Thank you. Uh, hopefully there will be constructive resolution to the soon as what we do. Yeah. Although it is mm -hmm. a controversy that has occurred in the station. So thank you again, and uh, thank you all for coming here to this program. I think this is awesome. Well, anyway, and uh, as I always mentioned, uh, please consider joining the, thank you all who are members of the Korea Society, and thank you for the board directors who showed up today. But for those who are not members, uh, please consider a very uh, modest amount uh, for paying membership to help us provide more programs of this nature. So thanks again for coming. Thank you.